Our speaker today will be Dr. David Underwood of the Lansing Bear School. presentation the other day and they did PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, we're back with transparencies. But um, my little segment that I have for today is going to deal with history and how Yahweh has overturned and overturned and overturned his purpose, his pattern and plan. And we should all hopefully know that the end result that we're looking for is that the Gentile kingdoms of this world is the kingdom of Yahshua Messiah. And that's over in Revelations 11 and 15. So this transparency here is a timeline as you can see. And this is kind of an anchor point for you to uh, hopefully picture and tie in what we're given. Now you can see that this is nothing more than 490 year cycles, which is nothing more than what's on our ages and dispensations chart that's behind the screen at this moment. And you look here, let me just go up on to the uh, stage. We start off with 1990, but we get our 1990 by going to the birth of Yash, uh, to Abraham, which is 1995, and subtracting out the 15 years of Ishmael, or the flesh. Now, I guess it's 1990, so from here to here, or 1980, that goes down to 1490. And we know we have that on our Moses chart. Moses had his vision, and 1490. So that's a 490-year cycle. So you start with, basically I'll just put a promise to a tabernacle. You go now 490 years more, and we have Solomon's temple. These are anchor points. We know that the temple is nothing, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but it's representative of a more glorious body that we're going to inherit, or a spiritual body. Then you go for 490 years more, down to who is called Zerubbabel. Then there's a gap period of 53 years, and then you have a Persian king who gives a, and again, that's supposed to be edict, not edit. And then you go down 457 years to the birth of the Messiah. And then the 33 years of his ministry, you now have a 490 year cycle. So let's go ahead and you can see a promise, a tabernacle, a temple, a temple, a promise, and then a spiritual body temple. Those are anchor points to look at 490 cycles. And again, that's nothing more than what's on this chart and also in Dr. Killing's score fire. Now, we're going to go down and have a look at things a little bit closer. Abraham was given a promise that his seed would what? Inherit Canaan's land, or our destination, which is a type and shadow of a spiritual inheritance. As you go through, you know that you end up having a son, Judah, who is told that he would have the scepter, correct? And it would never depop him. And Judah ended up being the kingship tribe. We also know, as it was stated last night, that Yahweh was going to make Israel a kingdom of priests. So here we are, that takes us down also, they're in bondage, as all was foretold and promised. 
And then we get down to the law and the tabernacle given. And everybody knows the significance of all of that. So let's move along here. Going down to here at 1490, we know that there were 40 years in the wilderness. We know that they were obedient basically during all the days of Joshua. Then those who well lived Joshua, and then finally they start doing as was already foretold. They wanted to go after other gods. But who was supposed to be their king, and who was supposed to be Yahweh? So during this time, something that's not normally talked about is the tribes go into, certain tribes, go into servitudes. There were six servitudes during this time of judges. And it should be with those scriptures there. And there were 14 judges that were there. This is in the fourth volume of your textbook. Now, as you move along, then you come down to Solomon's <coughs> Temple, which is a more glorious body that we're looking for. Now, you can see the scriptures that we have for here. Now, let's go on down then for the next section of the, the overhead. Now, you can start seeing things get pretty heavy when we start here at the Temple of Solomon. Because I'm go we're going from here all the way down to 510 or 490 years. There's quite information in there, isn't there? So let's start down here, Solomon. Now, if you read in the 6th chapter of Kings, 1st Kings 6th chapter, you don't have to read there, what we have is it says in the 480th year from the time they came out of bondage, they started the temple, which I think was the 4th year of the reign of Solomon. And Solomon started ruling, according to what we have in our textbook, in 1015. So the temple was started in uh, 1011. So now what takes place is the temple was built in about seven and a half years. Once it was built, we had about three and a half years to take us up to a jubilee year when the dedication took part. So you had the dedication of Solomon's temple in 1000 BBY, or before the birth of the Arch, or BC. And there's a difference, that's the, uh, a thing too, when you start getting into time differences between <coughs> BC and BBY, you know, before the birth of Yahshua. Now we know that Solomon's temple came in here in 1000. Now, it stood for a period of time, but until we have the kingdoms divided. So you have the kingdom of Israel, who had 19 kings. When you look through different commentaries, you have bad, bad, worse, the worse. Because you started off wrong with Jeroboam, who decided to build not just one golden calf, but two. So they were just totally given to idolatry throughout all the years of Israel's reign. So now we have nine different prophets that went to Israel. Then we have, as I said, the kingdom divided. Then we have Judah, which had 20 kings and about 19 different prophets that Yahweh sent unto them. So what takes place is, is in 771, which is 33 years, so if you were to come back 33 years this way, you have about 1,003, 1,004. So there's 33 years that Solomon's temple stood erect before it was molested by Shishak, an Egyptian king, which shows that Yahshua was, was going to be crucified or lived for 33 years. Now, time is moving along here, the two tribes, and you know they always had their infighting, a lot of infighting between the Israelites and, and the Jews, or the Jew, tribes of Judah, a lot of infighting. 
Plus, they're fighting other nations. They're going in confederacy with them. As we move along, now we have these ten tribes taken captive to Israel in 712. Assyria in 712. If you want to read a story that shows how Yahweh works in the face of false prophets, read about Reshaki, who was, I'll just call him the mouth of an Assyrian king. He went to Jerusalem to speak to them and say, look, why are you believing Hezekiah? Yahweh's not going to deliver you. He's given all these other gods of the lands that we conquered. They delivered their lands into our hand. What makes you think your Yahweh is going to save you? So go in and find out in about the 19th chapter of Kings or Chronicles and in the 37th chapter of Isaiah. They're all relate. And you can look into what took place when the Assyrian kings besieged Judah. But now, let me backtrack just half a minute. We had Deuteronomy written. You had the cursings and the blessings. Now, we have some scripture readers that are going to look at the scriptures for the scattering, and we're just going to go and show how Yahweh prophesied hundreds of years before they were scattered, that they were going to be scattered. How that Yahweh predicted that these children of Israel were going to worship other gods. How that the children of Israel were going to ask for a king. Scripture reader, you got scattered? Deuteronomy 4, 27. And Yahweh shall scatter you among the nations. Be free. And you shall be left few in number among the heathen. Whither Yahweh shall lead you. Continue. Next scripture, first scatter. Deuteronomy 28:54. And Yahweh shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there shall and thou and there thou shalt serve other Elam, which neither thou neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. Now, that is a prediction of when Judah ends up going into Babylon that they were going to serve other gods. Continue on. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy feet have rest. But Yahweh shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. Now, there was a lecture many years ago when there was a convention in Buffalo. And they showed pictures of the people who were Jews in the Holocaust. You've seen the pictures where they're standing behind that barbed wire fence as skeletons. Right. So it wasn't just back there, it brings it up today. And Continue on. In, in. First Kings 15, 14, 14, and 15. For Yahweh shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river. So if they were to do what Yahweh said, they would have blessings. If Yahweh did not see them do as he requested or asked, they would have curses. And these are things that he would do. And that's just part of what he said he would do. The land would yield its fruit. The children that they ended up having would not be their children, etc. So the, read through the curses and the blessings that are in the 28th chapter, 27, 28 chapter of um, Deuteronomy. Now, 712 is when Israel is taken in captivity to the Assyrians. Judah's still here, and they're not necessarily any better. You did have a couple of their kings that tried to restore 
the appropriate worship of Yahweh. I think there was Hezekiah and Josiah, and there may have been another. But still, they had bad kings as well. So time moves along until we have this point of 604. This is when you had Nebuchadnezzar coming in to besiege Jerusalem and take Jerusalem. Now remember, find there where it talks about um, the punishing you seven times. I said that there were four, six servitudes that during the time of the judges. But Yahweh said he was going to punish them seven times. So this is where the seventh time of servitude is going to come in is this, I call it house arrest. Mm -hmm. This period of time between 604 and 601. Everybody knows what house arrest is, right? Okay, in other words, if you are a released parolee or on probation, you may wear a tether and be in your own house or within restriction, okay? Do so you find the scripture there? Leviticus, 6, uh, Leviticus 26 and 18. Please. And if you, will, if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So here it is. They had six punishments there. Now they're having their last one between 604 and 601. And you see at this time, Daniel was taken captive to Babylon. And that's the seventh servitude in their own land. But why is Yahweh doing this? He's putting them into servitude. Well, what takes place is, is find where it talks about the Sabbath, if you would, please. And we're going to look at that. But not only with Daniel going into bondage, that's Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. As you would call them, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Which was gone into last night is the Babylonians and Assyrians just changed names of people. Okay? They changed Daniel's name to Belshazzar. Belshazzar. They changed Abednego, uh, Hananiah, and Mishael to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. All right, and you end up having them, their gods that they are worshiping, instead of, as we were told, to Yaz and Manel. Okay, so go ahead if you would pick up. Leviticus, Leviticus 25th chapter, fourth verse. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for Yahweh. Now remember, Yahweh gave the Sabbath for a man. Six days was he to work, and the seventh day that he was to rest. But he also gave the land a Sabbath as well. Because we know that if you have seven weeks of Sabbath, that's going to take you to where? 49 years, right? And they were to leave the land, I'll just call it fallow. I think that's an appropriate term. And then the next year would be the Jubilee year, which is a year they also didn't work the land. So in the 48th year, they got enough to sustain them really for three years. In the 48th year. Now, and there's other scriptures that talks about the seven times punishment in here. So we have Daniel now going off into bondage. Now we're going to, let's go down to the next level here. Now let's go here. Stay here for a second. We'll just finish this out. Then in 580, then and you see right here, 601, now we have the time of the Gentiles coming in. It's supposed to be a 2520 time frame. But you also end up having something called the fullness of the time fullness of the times of the Gentiles come in, which is a difference. The fullness of the Gentiles coming in is when you look over here to the Karna Ordnance chart, on the far right hand side, everybody look at the Karna Ordnance chart, you see where the Jews came in, seven years later is the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. That's you and me, folks. That's when we came in. All right? Which is different than times of the Gentiles. Now, in 580, now there's also, at this time, other deportations of Jews out of Judah into Babylon. And 
586, you can see that Solomon's temple was finally destroyed. They don't have a temple now to worship him. Okay? Then you can see here, Daniel has a vision. But, before Daniel has his vision, we're going to take a change. Let's go ahead and take a change of um, overhead. The one that's right there in front of you. Now, now you can go ahead and keep that. Now, folks, what you see here is nothing more than your Daniel chart. All right? Sometimes you need a little perspective on what you see. Well, let's look at this. It talks about in the second chapter of Daniel, which the readers are going to read in 2 and 32, that this Nebuchadnezzar had a vision. And we had it gone into last night on the Daniel chart. And this would be some of the repetition. So Nebuchadnezzar has his vision. And what takes place is, I enjoy this part because... He wanted his soothsayers, diviners, astrologers, and you say it how? Chaldeans, the Chaldeans, to interpret what he saw without him telling them what he saw. And you know what their response was? That's a hard thing, king, because no king has ever asked us to do anything like that. Does that make sense? Because you know back here with... Uh, Joseph, Joseph was told the dream, and Yahweh gave the interpretation. So at this point in time, Daniel was going to be in fear of his life, along with Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Because what took place was, is the king says, if you can't tell me, I'm going to wipe all of you out of my kingdom. Because I know you lied to me anyway. And you're going to, you know, what's the word? You're going to just prolong the, the situation until it's forgotten about. You know what I'm saying? So Daniel heard what was going to take place, and he talks to Antioch, this pronunciation. In other words, he's a chief man of, of Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, though, hey, look, what's going to happen is, is all of the astrologers and soothsayers are going to be killed because they can't interpret Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And Daniel said, Yahweh, give me the understanding of what was seen by Nebuchadnezzar. And he was given the understanding of what Nebuchadnezzar saw, and he did go in front of the king. So let's go to 2 and 32. Now, we're going to break this up, because you're going to have 2 and 32, 2 and 32, and 2 and 32. Just kind of break it down by the metal. Does that make sense? Then go over to the seventh chapter for the corresponding. You do the interpretation, then go to the corresponding in Daniel, the seventh chapter. You see how it's laid out? Okay. Daniel 2 and 32. This image's head was of fine gold. Now here it is. The image that Daniel was telling Nebuchadnezzar was of fine gold. Now go to the interpretation. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold that he saw in his image. Now let's look over here at this chart. That's what this is. Here's that head of gold of the image. Okay? Let's go to the, the seventh chapter of Daniel. Daniel 7 and 4. The first was like a lion. So here it is. That first is like a lion that Daniel saw in 555. Well, as was pointed out, there's the lined up right here on the Daniel chart. Here's the lion right above the gold head. And the interpretation of that lion is? 17th verse. These great beasts which are four, are four kings which shall rise, arise out of the earth. So those beasts are going to be kings. Okay? Now let's go back here then to silver in 2 and 32. This, this, go ahead. This image's head was a fine gold. So fine gold was the head which 
corresponds to the lion, which is going to be Nebuchadnezzar. Continue. His breast and his arms of oh, silver. So here his breast and his arms are going to be silver. And let's read the interpretation. 39 verse. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of breast. That's okay. No, we only want the silver at the moment. So that was the interpretation. Is there an interpretation? 7 5. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it, and it had great iron teeth. No, I think we're, we got lost in there. Okay, let's go back again. So we know that Media of Persia is the kingdom that Yahweh overturned Babylon to. Okay? And so Media of Persia is, is the inferior kingdom to Babylon. And when you look over in the seventh chapter, Daniel saw this bear, which is Medio Persian. Persia. Huh? Seven and five. Okay. Seven and five. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it was raised, and it raised up itself on one side. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, arise devour much flesh. Okay. And as we look here, you got the head of gold and the lion. You have media Persia, which is of the silver. And then above it is the bear. Line right up. <coughs> Let's go down now to bronze. And uh, 2 and 32, his belly and his thighs of breath. So here we go from gold the head, the silver the uh, chest and the arms. And now we're coming down to the belly and the thighs, which is going to be brass. The interpretation is 39. And another third kingdom of brass. Okay. Now that's going to be, end up being Grisha or Alexander the Great, who took over at a young age as a general and conquered all that place called Babylon, Persia, and beyond Persia, toward the east. <coughs> now, let's go ahead into the seventh chapter. Seven and six. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a, like a leper, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fox. Now, there's four wings up here, and the interpretation is? Seventeenth verse. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So there's four kings that are going to arise up out of the earth. So you have Alexander. Alexander died at a young age. He didn't leave a will saying, I'm going to give it to my son or somebody else. So what takes place is, there was infighting, and his kingdom was split into four geographical areas. Make sense? Okay. So now, let's go down here to the next part for iron. 2 and 33, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So here it is, iron, his feet were part iron and clay in the interpretation. 2 and 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth <coughs> all things. So the Romans subdued the rest of these kingdoms. Because Rome, as you can see, took all around the Mediterranean coast as their kingdom, and on up into Britain and other places. So let's go on over to the seventh chapter. Seven and seven. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Okay. So now, interpretation at all? 717. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. So this is going to be for the kings. So here we are, we can just see how chapter 2 and chapter 7 are lined up. So that's nothing more 
the lion and the gold, the bear and the silver. You have the leopard and Grisha. Now you have that terrible beast over pagan and papal Rome. Just lined up right here on the chart for us. Now, you can go on and then take the eighth chapter and just see how what Daniel saw about a ram and the goat, and you can see where they're lined up for, right along here. And then you go back and you can see down how that Daniel was caused to understand the vision that Jeremiah had in 25 and 11. Let's go to Jeremiah 25 and 11, about the 70 weeks. Now remember, Daniel is in Babylon. Hananiah, Azariah, and also Mishael are there. But you also have the contemporaries of Daniel, the people that lived in the prophets at the same time. You had Jeremiah, who was basically still in Jerusalem, that was taken to Egypt. You had Ezekiel, who also went off into bondage into Babylon and one of the deportations. So all of them are about the same time, overlap. So let's go to the 70 weeks. Jeremiah 25, 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So what takes place is, is once Israel, or Judah, I should say, they are in the bondage. So they go to bondage here in 604. And, okay, and then you start counting down the 70 years from the point that Daniel saw, he, caused, he was caused to understand of Jeremiah. Now, let us, um, let's go back to the other transparency for a second. Yeah, now let's go, we'll be, we'll be down at the bottom. Let's just finish it off here. So you can see that Daniel had his vision, and he was 49 years from the time that they went into bondage. Then what you end up having then is you have Babylon falling to the Medo-Persians. And that takes place where Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, ends up deciding he wants to party with the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, took out of Solomon's temple. Does that make sense? Would you want to party with Yahweh's vessels? No. But he decided he wanted to party with it. And then that's when the handwriting was on the wall. And Belshazzar saw many, many temple and farces. If you would go ahead and get that for me, for me please, again. So here's Belshazzar. Now, he also had that problem. His Chaldeans, his astrologers, they couldn't interpret what was written. But the queen says, oh, there's this Daniel who interpreted for your father, which doesn't necessarily mean father. It could be a relative type of situation. In this case, grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Do you find that for us? Please. Daniel 7, 24. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, tekel you farsen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, Eloah hath numbered by kingdom and finished it. Yahweh has said it's going to last basically 70 years from the time that you started taking Israel into bondage. Because, see, what you had is, is somewhere around 612 is when the Babylonians started to raise in power. They just conquered Judah in 604. All right? So their kingdom lasted more than 70 years. But once Israel got down there, they spent their 70 years. Yahweh did as he prophesied. He was going to punish that nation that Israel went into bondage to. Okay. 
Isn't that the same thing that Yahweh told Abraham? That his seed would go down into bondage to a nation they didn't know of, right? And that they would come out with great substance, but he was going to execute judgment upon them. And we know what happened to Pharaoh back here. Well, same thing down here is Yahweh executed judgment upon this Babylonian king. All right? Now, what's interesting is, is you're having an overturn from Babylon to the Medes and Persians. Let's go back to the 44th chapter, last verse, and the first verse of 45. Isaiah. Isaiah. What did I say? Okay. I said, I said, I, I thought I said 44 in last verse and 45 in one. So which 44 last verse and which 45 in first verse, right? Okay. Isaiah, Isaiah 44, 28. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Hold it. I thought Moses was supposed to be a type and shadow of a shepherd. But now we have a Gentile Cyrus that's going to be called a shepherd. Continue on, please. And shall perform all my pleasure. See, and Cyrus is going to perform all Yahweh's pleasures. Continue. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So before Zerubbabel's temple was built, and we basically say it was finished in 510, there had to be a decree by this one Cyrus that the wall or the temple was going to be built. And you know what? It wasn't just yesterday that Cyrus made that prophecy. It was at least 150 years before Cyrus was made king. To me, that should be witness enough that Yahweh can do what he wants to do, whatever he wants to do it to. Does that make sense? So here he is. Let's go to 45 and 1. And this is going to probably blow your head a little bit. So I'll just hang on to your seat. Please do read. Thus said Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus. Oh, hold it. I thought Yahshua Messiah was the anointed. Let's grant your heads on that one for a second. But Yahweh had commissioned him to do his will. And he called him his shepherd and his anointed. Now, when you go on and reread through that, that he is Yahweh, there is none else, and I girded thee before you were born, we normally take that to be who? We kind of look at ourselves, don't we? Well, Yahweh did do that. But in this case, when you're reading there in Isaiah, he's talking about Cyrus. And when you get over to the uh, 46th chapter, it talks about Baal and Nebo stooping. Well, who are Baal and who are Nebo? But gods, Baal gods, Nebo, Nebuchadnezzar, right? Here it is. Yahweh's going to bring them down. But he called Cyrus the one he's going to overturn it to. He gave it to Babylon to come in and take Judah captive. Now he's going to give it to the Medes and Persians to restore them. But you know what? That sounds like a good deed, but you think Yahweh's going to be nice to them? No, because he's going to overturn the Medes and the Persians. Because that's when he then ends up eventually bringing in Alexander the Great. But let's go ahead. So in 534 is the decree of Cyrus, and then for those 24 years, you end up having Joshua, Joshua, which we know would be in Joshua, Zerubbabel, and Ezra going back to get the building started. Now you know what? We're all human, like they are. You get excited, you go in, you work hard, and then your excitement wanes. So, there is type of wane. And things got bogged down. They had their infighting, and they had their outside forces hindering them as well. 
But eventually, they got a temple built. Was it as a grand as scale as Solomon's temple? By no means. But now they have a temple that they can worship in. So that closes out that 490-year cycle. A lot of information in that point. But now let's go back again. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 36 and 21. Now remember, Yahweh was going to end up punishing them seven times, wasn't he? So he did that six over twos here with the judges, and the seventh one here, 601 to 603, with the three years of house arrest. He was going to put them in bondage for 70 years. Why was he going to put them in bondage for 70 years? Because the land needed the Sabbath. They didn't give the land the Sabbath during the time that they were there. So let's read what it says in 2 Chronicles 36 and 21. It's going to catch in those two points. Please read. 2 Chronicles 36 and 21. To fulfill the word of Yahweh. Now here it is. To fulfill the word of Yahweh. By the mouth of Jeremiah. And we read it in 25 and 11. And you can read it in a couple others in Jeremiah. which talks about the 70 years. Continue. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. Now here it is. The land has enjoyed its Sabbaths. The land hadn't enjoyed a Sabbath during all that time that they were in the land. Let's start, start about in here. They didn't enjoy, the land didn't enjoy its Sabbath. So here's Yahweh going to say, okay, if you're not going to let the land keep it, I'll make it keep the land. I will put you into bondage. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else here? To fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. And there's the 70 years that it's talking about over in Daniel 25 and 11. So now let's go on down here and just look at this a little bit further. So you have your 70 years of captivity from 604 to 634 in the way that they created Cyrus. You can see that Daniel's vision is 555, and this is a volume four of the Elohim book. This is nothing that you can't find and see and put your fingers on. Then you see the period of time of 24 years where they, as I explained, they were hot and getting it built. They got in there, they got bogged down. You had uh, Ezra coming in to be a rah-rah, more or less, to get them going and get it built. Don't be you know, a slagger, get it built. Then you have this 53 years between here and here. Now, this, those 53 years, is, as I've seen it explained, is basically this way. You have, and I'm, I know that some of you on the far side are not going to see this, but I know you, that you have the Moses chart pretty well in your mind. So we know that the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, of bondage, is there possibly a correlation to coming out of bondage back here with the Exodus and coming out of bondage to Babylon? Is there any possible correlation there? Okay. So here it is. We know that it was how many days from there to where the law spoke down? 53 days. That 53-year gap. Another one witness is, is from the time that Yahshua's death, buried, resurrected, and out carrying and out pouring of the Holy Spirit, there's how many days? 53. 53 days. So that is the explanation I understand for that, that gap time of 53 years in there. Now, we have this one called Artaxerxes. Here I can spell correctly. Okay? And we have Artaxerxes eating. Now this here is a Persian, a Persian, and he gives an edict to Nehemiah to go back and to restore and build the walls. So here is going to be, be the beginning, and I think you're going to find that, is it in the ninth chapter of Daniel? I have a little fuzz ball right at this Daniel point. Daniel 9 and 2. Please. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by book the number of years. Go to 24. 
9.24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin. Now, a week of years is seven years. And then 70 week of years is going to be then 490 years. And who's going to put away the end of sin? Yahshua. Who's going to do away with all sacrifices? Yahshua. So, we have starting thinking that 490 years where the Edict of Artaxerxes, this is Syrian king, excuse me, Medo-Persian, no, yeah, Medo-Persian, or Persian king, all the way down. Now, there's no zero. You don't go one, zero, one. You don't go 1 B.C., 0, 1 A.D. Right. Okay? So, someone was saying, well, they may not understand if we go from here and add this. But this is all before the birth of Yahshua here. And then you add the 33 years, making the 400, I mean, 490 years. All right? Now, as we move along in the story... You have Artaxerxes who gives that edict. And you have Nehemiah, who's in, made the governor. And he makes a couple of different trips back into Jerusalem during that time. Well, as time moves along, you have basically right in this time frame, anybody ever heard of Esther? Yeah. Esther. See, what makes it difficult for us to understand the Bible? It's not made chronologically. You have... Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, right after Psalms, I think, or after the Judges, after the Chronicles, after the Chronicles. But they're taking place, you see where it is? They're all the way on down, even after the captivity. Does that make sense? That's what makes it difficult when you look at the Bible. So Esther is taking place, and you all know the story of Mordecai and Haman. How Haman was going, was, he was basically jealous of Mordecai. Mm -hmm. He was jealous of Mordecai, and just, it just ate him up because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. So he decided to build this gallows to hang Mordecai. Now, at this time, Esther had not revealed that she is a Jewish, is that correct? To, they call it Os, um, Xerxes, all right? And... She finally makes herself known and pleads to him to change the edict. But once it's been spoken, can it be changed? No. So what he does is he gives them the power to defend themselves. And then what takes place is, is Haman gets what he has planned to do to Mordecai, which is to hang him. And all Mordecai's family was hung as well. So all of this is Haman's, Haman's family was taken, all this took place during this period of time. Then you have Nehemiah. Now as you move along, this is when now you have, now this is when the, uh, Alexander the Great starts off on his conquest. This is not necessarily the time that they conquer Jer um, Jerusalem. So now you have an overturning where you end up having that lion, or that leopard that we see here and the brass man. Or as pointed out last night, those beast men. Here they are. Alexander the Great comes in. And as I said, he ends up dying and his kingdom is split into four parts. You have Macedonia. You have basically, I'll just call it the area of Turkey. Then you have Egypt. Anybody ever heard of the Ptolemies? Anybody ever hear of Cleopatra? Yeah. How about a Ptolemy? Starts with a P. Right. Ptolemy. Everybody, does it strike anybody? I'm yeah, I've heard of Because most of us study this in school. How many were good in history or like history? <laughs> yeah, not many of us. So that's what makes it hard. Because I'm talking a foreign tongue in here. Okay, it cites me. It may not look like it, but it cites me. But you have... You have uh, Ptolemy, 
the Ptolemy ruling Egypt. And you end up having the Seleucids ruling what is called Syria. Now, who do you think is between those two kingdoms? Who do you think are between the Ptolemies and the Syria, Assyria? Make a connection. Who's in between those two? The South King and the North King, which is spoken about in Daniel, the other chapters. Who's in between but Palestine or Jerusalem? So they're in the way of everybody fighting. They're in the way. If they want to get there, they got to go through there. So what do they do? They take their cattle, they pillage and whatever they do. And then when they want to go here, they do the same thing. So they're in the middle. Okay? Now, let's go back to Alexander for a second. Alexander, anybody ever heard of Alexandria, Egypt? Yeah. 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 See, there was a great library there. Yep. And what he tried to do was encourage the Jews to come to Alexandria. And there are already a lot of Jews down there from the time of Jeremiah. Does that make sense? Jeremiah went captive to Egypt with a host of other Israelites, or Jew, Jew, um, Yehudi, or whatever you want to call them. You understand what I'm saying? They went into bondage. There were already a lot down there. They already had a community. So here it is. Alexander wants to start name Heliopolis. You think there was a Heliopolis down there during the time of Pharaoh? No. Because Heliopolis would be a what? Greek. A Greek name. Greek. Okay? A helio means what? Sun. So it would be a sun city. Opolis. Megalopolis. Right? So here it is. Is he wanted to start naming all of these Bring in the Greek culture. Well, part of the Greek culture, who do we have during this time? Anybody ever heard of Socrates? Yeah. Sure. Aristotle? Mm -hmm. Plato? Yeah. Homer? Yeah. All the Greek culture? Yeah. He's going to make the Greek culture in the world. So here it is, as Alexander dies, and he's leaving his legacy, more or less. So his kingdom is split, and as time moves along, you end up having then this one called Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Do we have a dictionary? You can just look up Epiphanes. When we see words like Epiphanes, we start scratching our head, don't we? When we see the words like Apocalypse, we start, you know what I'm saying? Like we had the word anthropomorphic at one time. Mm -hmm. We can just throw that around like it's nothing now. But one time we had a fear of it. We didn't know how to use it, what it is. What's an epiphany? Moment right? of revelation. But here it is that you have Antiochus IV, who is now a Seleucid, who believes in... Has anybody ever heard of Helen of Troy? Mm -hmm. Helen, Hellenism? The Greek culture? Bring back some of your Hellenism. knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I was sitting here yesterday in my seat, and it talked about how Yahweh is going to spoil the principalities of this world. So that knowledge you had of Cleopatra and all the different kings, Yahweh spoiled that knowledge and now has given you some light and understanding of what you already knew as a carnal way. Does that make sense? You can now apply it to Yahweh's purpose. He spoiled that carnal knowledge that you had. Did he change it any? You changed your understanding a lot. Understand? You got the epiphany? A revelatory manifestation of a divine being. So here it is. A revelatory or a manifest. That's what epiphany means. Not hard, is it? So here it is. You have him wanting to, to Hellenize the world. Greeks. What do you think of Greek? What do you think about Someone throw out something. What do you think when you think Greek? Think. What is Athens. It? Greek gods. What kind of god? Chief god. Zeus. How about hey? Is it Jesus? <coughs> is that what it says in the Holy Name Bible? Jesus. Healing Zeus. Jesus. Right? Okay. So Zeus is a 
God, you think maybe he would try to get the Jews to worship Zeus? Would that be an abomination maybe? Yep. How about a pig? As a sacrifice. So that's what he tried to do, is to get, he goes into the temple and offers up a pig and tries to make the Jews worship Zeus. So he starts here in Lansing when he does that. Then he says, well, I'm going to go over to DeWitt, I'm going to go to Holt, I'm going to go to these other cities around Jerusalem, and I'm going to start making them do the same thing. Well, when he gets into the city that some people said, well, we don't think this is what we should do. They kill the messenger, and a Maccabean revolt starts. Anybody ever heard of Maccabees? Normally, we don't deal with the Maccabees. Why not? Because we don't carry a Roman Catholic Bible around with us. But if you took a Roman Catholic Bible, you would find in there this history of the Maccabees. And they would talk about some of this. But now, let me just make one point. Once you get a little bit past Nehemiah, you have the last prophet in the Old Testament. Who is that? Malachi. Malachi would be the last prophet that Yahweh spoke to to speak to Judah. So for 400 years approximately, Yahweh's not speaking to him. I mean, do we have anything in there in between? Is Yahweh always speaking to him? No. No. It's that gap of about 400 years. Yahweh's not, I sent so-and-so, or I was sent, or Yahweh showed me, or I was, you understand? Yahweh's silent. But that doesn't mean that history or his story is not moving along. Does that make sense? Yep. It's still moving along. This in what most Bible people call an intertestament period. This 400 period, 400 years of time. So you have the Maccabees here that revolt against Antiochus. Now, shortly after that, we end up having an overturn again. Here we go. Overturn from lion and gold to bear and silver to leopard and brass to terrible beast, iron and clay. An overturn. Now, most, how many people have this chart in your class? Now, see, but not a lot of schools do. As we said last night, uh, this was the last chart that was approved by Dr. Kinley to, to have made, correct? One of the last ones. So, but most schools don't have it. So some people get pretty afraid of it. But it hasn't been pretty simple so far. You had last night, this way here, and you say, oh, it's lined up. Oh, it's lined up. Oh, it's lined up. Okay? And it, everybody knows overturn, 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 right? Pretty easy connection. And as, as was gone through, then you have this mark of the beast. How he's building what? Cities or kingdoms. Okay? Now, you have Rome come in in 63. They start, I would assume they start taking over Palestine or, the, or Ju uh, Jerusalem. So down in 16 BB or BC is when Herodian Temple is started. So let's go to the, I think it's second chapter. And I didn't write it down there, so you're going to have to help me on find this. Is, huh? Uh, John. John, John 2, 19. Now, that is different than what we read later on down in, I think it was John or maybe Matthew, where we talked about uh, this temple being destroyed. Because what he was talking about, that Herod's temple was going to be destroyed. So there's two incidences where he's talking about the temple. And the first one is here in this, uh, John 2 and 22, and we'd like to get the other one where he talks about it. Please go ahead. John 2 and 19. 
Yahshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, we understand that Yahweh knows the difference between that and this. An example. Eat up that bread, and you die. That's the death cookie. Eat up this bread, and you will live forever. Right? There's a difference between that and this. So when he said, this bread, eat up, he meant his physical, he meant not his physical body. All right? Type and shadow. But what he is saying here is, destroy this temple, and in three days he will raise it up. And that's what we need to believe that his death, burial, resurrection accomplished all that it was supposed to accomplish for our salvation. Moved it out of the way so we don't have to do anything but believe that he did it. Now those are simple words, but it's taken all this, hopefully, for someone to understand. So now, read that again, please. Yahshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So here it is, the Herodian temple had already been in building for 46 years. Right? 46 years this temple has been in the building. So this is a period of time just before, Yahshua, just after Yahshua was baptized. Because how many years is he in his ministry? So 46 and 3 is a cycle of 49. Or in principle, you could say even a 490 year cycle. But a principle of 49. So here it is, is 46 years, here it is, three days, you tear this temple down and I'll raise it again. But how did the people take it when they went in to accuse him? They said, you tear that Herodian temple down, in three days he's going to raise that up. In 46 years in this building, were they carnal minded? Yeah. So it was his spiritual body that he was going to raise up, and not a physical body, or a physical temple. So now we end up, obviously, getting to this point at the end of a 409 year cycle. Now, that's a lot of history. And hopefully somebody has been able to, you know, tie in how that you have those 490 year cycles, starting with basically Abraham to the tabernacle, to the more glorious temple, Solomon's temple, 490 years. How we go then down to Zerubbabel's temple. How we have a gap, which we explained in the 53 years, which is the 53 days from <coughs> Egypt up into the promised land. How Yahshua did, buried, resurrected, tarried for 40 days, outpouring the Holy Spirit for 10 days, and then coming back. Okay? So now, then you have Artaxerxes' Eden, and then Yahshua's temple. Then you end up having, as you can see, remember the servitudes of the judges. Six servitudes when they were in, had the judges. And then the seventh one that Dr. Kinley says that most people fail to address is that one that takes place, if I can find it again, between here and here, the seventh servitude. Okay? And the reason they're going into servitude was basically not only because of their disobedience for following those other gods, but not allowing the land to enjoy its Sabbath. Okay? Then we end up again, as you can see, having the 70 years, which was prophesied by Jeremiah. And again, those were the 70, the Sabbath time that they didn't let the land enjoy. Now, when you stand here, you know that there's a lot more that can be said. Because we know that, see, this chart is showing how we can mark that beast man with his sixes. It's, take a psychological profile. He's building something without authorization. Here he comes out. He builds this Enoch. 
the city. Then we go down to Nimrod, and they called this a kingdom, where they had a one heart and one mind, they started building a kingdom because they don't believe that Yahweh is not going to destroy the world by water anymore. And what I think I like to stress a lot is they're going to make themselves a name. They're going to make themselves a name back here. So what takes place is, is we know that Babylon, Nimrod, the first kingdom of Babylon, is set up in the earth plane. And what takes place is, is all the theories, concepts, and opinions are spread to the four corners of the earth. Everybody got that? Everything, all their theories, opinions, and imagination are spread to the four corners of the earth. Now, this is the first Babylon. What's the current day Babylon that we normally say something about, but the Church of Rome, right? Once the 1400s came along, what was that, especially the late 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, what was that period of time called? A period of exploration. They started sailing to other countries. And who do you think they had in their boats with them, besides soldiers? They had the priests to help convert the heathen, the pagans, right? So when they went in to sell them and give them Jesus and Mary, they already had in those cultures that concept that started back here of Tammuz and Samaramis. Uh, Samaramis. Samaramis, thank you. Does that make sense? See, it started way back here, and it's just gone right on down through the ages. So when they went in, and so it was an easy sell to the nation. If they went into India, they had the concept. If they went into China, they had that concept. So now, these theories and opinions went all throughout the earth. We were shown that there was political religious and economic, correct? Last night. So here it is, kingdom, a kingdom with Babylon, people were split. Then, what ends up taking place, as we know, you end up having Abraham. Abraham is given a promise, as we already said, and that his seed was going to inherit a kingdom or a nation, or a land, which is going to be a type and a shadow of that land we're supposed to inherit. Now, most people take it as what kind of a land? Physical. A physical land. Because you have those Jews today, and those Palestinians today, fighting over some physical land in Jerusalem. Now, sometimes we don't get out and do the investigation we should. Because I've never really been exposed much to the things called rapture, tribulation, millennial period of time. These are terms that a lot of end time prophecy ministers use. Are most of you familiar with those type, type terms? There's a few. I mention them now because this is what's going to be tied in in the next few speakers. All right. So if you're familiar with the terms, it's going to end up helping you to bring it back to your remembrance. Now, most of the end time prophecy people go into Daniel the chapter where it talks about 70 weeks of determined upon your people and it talks about there will be 7 weeks and then excuse me, 7 weeks? read it here because I keep forgetting I want to get the wrong numbers Daniel 9.4 please 
Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. See, now what they have is, and their concept will be explained by this next part right here. Please read. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem now to the remember Messiah, that's the edict that was given back here with their Artaxerxes the prince shall be seven weeks so now they have seven weeks and three, seven weeks and years is how many years 49 years continue and three score in two weeks so three score is 63 weeks so now they're going to get up to this point where you have 483 years and they leave now the next part. Go ahead. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in the tr even in troublous times. So they did have troublous time when they were trying to build these walls. But go ahead. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the princess shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now this is where the Christians take this 70th week, and it's a week that is to come. In other words, they get the Messiah coming in, basically on, I'll just say Good Friday is a lack of a better term, he's riding in on his animal into Jerusalem. <laughs> That's the end of the 483 years to them. So this one week is this future week that is to come. Now what takes place in this point in time is they're going to have something called the church age. So here you have all these church people being preached to. And we already know they've gone and preached on every continent on the planet. But we know if this gospel has been preached in all the world, then the end would come. Well, there's a difference between that gospel and this gospel. So what they have then is this, they're out there preaching, Lord God, Jesus Christ, falsehoods, and then what they're going to end up having is something called a rapture. And they take that because Jesus is going to come down and snatch up those who believe in him into the heavens. Because it says, as you see him go, you're going to see him come. Right. And everybody sits here and scratches their head and say, well, I live in China and Joe lives in Jerusalem. Now I can't see Joe, so how am I going to see him come if I'm on the opposite side of the world? Does it not feel like a, seem like a physical impossibility? But these are things that people think. And eventually they're going to come and take them up to heaven. And then at this point, they're going to have this 70th week that is going to start, and they call it a tribulation. And there's scriptures that talks about tribulation, great tribulation. And they have different concepts of pre-rapture, post-rapture. You know, there's, there's so many terms, it's hard to keep track of all of them. But what they're going to end up having during this one week of time is they're going to have this tribulation. In other words, this is where they end up having this, this man. A lot of people want to um, point to the United Nations, some type of new world order. They end up having the economic power of the European market. They're going to have this man who has such charisma that he's going to make a covenant with the Israelites to be able to build a temple where the Dome of the Mosque, Dome of the Rock, of the Muslims is now, which is on where Mount Moriah or Solomon's Temple is built. Does anybody see a conflict with that? I see a problem. There's a problem. You have the Muslims say, that's ours, 
then you have the Jews say, we want to build there. And they don't get along now. You think it would definitely be some type of war if that were to take place. Mm -hmm. When it was Ariel Sharon, I think it was, went back a couple of years ago, that started all of these riots, a lot of them, in Jerusalem today. Does that make sense? In other words, we can bring it up to today. Right. Things are going on. These are people that know Bible prophecy. These people go in there and they put their twist on Bible prophecy. Let me put it that way. And this is what drives them. This is what drives presidents and kings and rulers. You think it's any different than Nebuchadnezzar having his astrologers and soothsayers back here in Babylon? Getting his advice? Don't, don't you think Bush has his advisors? You see what I'm saying? So these people are, going to, are trying to, what's the word, play chess. If we do this, this may happen. We don't want that to happen, so we better do this. But if, you see how convoluted it can get real quick. Because chess is not an easy game. So, you end up having then these, this, this person coming in, and they talk about this buying and selling in the scripture. And that's where these Gentiles get the concept of maybe having a computer chip in you or some means of keeping you from buying if you don't believe their way. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, during all this time, some people say in the midst of that week, this charismatic man, I'll put it, ends up breaking that covenant with Jerusalem, or the Jews, because they're going to build it. And you know what? They want to build a temple a mile by a mile within a city of 50 by 50. Where the Dome of Rock is. <laughs> These are concepts that are out there. Are many people familiar with it? Some are, some aren't. But this is, you know, this is called encourage and promote the study of the scriptures. Okay? So we need to understand what they're, what they're because see, the reason we had ministers here last night from the Assemblies of Yahweh is because of these end time prophecies. That's where they're at. So they come to find out. But did they find out what they thought? Not in the least. Not in the least. They find out that there's a whole spiritual operation going on and not carnal. Because as I'm sitting listening to the prophecy in a room just over here last week, they're talking about physical sacrifices in the temple. And I'm sitting here thinking, sacrifice and offerings, thou wouldest not, but a body that... So excuse me, you want to build a temple? Don't you see that scripture? <laughs> and as was pointed out last night, do you, don't you believe that his crucifixion, don't you believe it was good enough? Don't you believe that his crucifixion was good enough to save a wretch like us? And they want to go about and establish their own righteousness. So what will take place is there's going to be this great war of Armageddon. Anybody heard of Megiddo? Yep. In the Bible, Megiddo was a very famous battleground north west of, or north, north of Jerusalem. A lot of battles were fought in the ghetto. So that's where they're going to end up having the Jews leave out of Jerusalem and there's going to be this great fighting. This is this midweek. And sacrifices were stopped. But who is the true end of the sacrifices? Joshua. Joshua had already done that <laughs> 2,000 years ago. He already put an end to sacrifices then. That's what makes it tough to keep, keep it, in, it understand what they're saying. It's like, it's, that, what I'm saying to you is foreign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to keep it, keep it in context. So after that midweek period of time, then you're going to have Joshua coming back. And then you're going to end up having then this millennial period of a thousand years where he's going to reign. I think somewhere toward the end of that uh, seventh week, 
they're going to have that serpent cast down into the bottomless pit. Now, we know who has the keys to the bottomless pit, right? And that's Joshua Messiah. He's already taken back the key, taken back the power of death from Satan. So Satan doesn't have that power of death over us anymore. Joshua has always had the power of life, but he took it back the power of death. Okay? Now, those are some of the topics that are going to be moved into later on as we move into the next few speakers. And then you're going to end up finding out that there are other numbers that we have not really ever touched on. Anybody ever heard of 1260? Mm -hmm. 1335? Nope. 1290? 2520? Yep. So these are other numbers that are going to be coming as we move along. So you can see where things have been building as we move along in these lectures. And I think I maybe have some of the hardest part, but most of us don't like history. But hopefully it's been slow enough that you can kind of tie things that you have heard and what has been said together that you can say, hey, I'm beginning to get a clearer picture of how Yahweh has overturned and set up kings and kingdoms and tore them down and did it over and over and over. Because we're waiting for Shiloh, whose right it is. And that's Yahshua's right. It's going to be these kingdom of, are of his world. And as we already know, the devil already tempted him back in Matthew, the fourth chapter, with all the kingdoms of this world. Bow down and I'll give them to you. Well, he just didn't know that there are already Yahshua's. He just didn't know. He thought he could give something that wasn't really even his. Now, we got a few little scriptures that are left at the very bottom there. John 18 and 36. Yahshua answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, this is what chapter? John 18, chapter 36, verse. Okay. Please read again. Yeah. Yahshua answered, My kingdom is not of this world. So Yahshua's kingdom is not of this world. Remember, when Yahshua was coming in, people thought that he was going to fight the Romans. And he was going to set up some type of physical carnal kingdom. But he said what again? My kingdom is not of this world. So his kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Now when the devil, I'll just put it that way, in Judas, came in and deceived Yahshua with a kiss, you, didn't you have one of his servants come in and take out his sword? Right? But all that had to happen, he just puts back the man's ear, and goes back to his crucifixion. Right? Because he has to die. Please read. But now is my kingdom not of from hence. See, his kingdom is not of this world. It's not here in the physical that we're looking for Yahshua to come back. We're not looking for him to come back to Jerusalem or any other physical city. Anything else? Keep reading the scriptures. Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of Yahweh is not meat and drink, but righteousness send peace, send joy in the Holy Spirit. So, is that pretty self-explanatory? It's not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom that we're looking for that is not of this earth. Next group. Luke 17, 20. And when he asked of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of the Lord should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of Yahweh cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there. For behold, Yahweh's king is in your midst. So, that's showing what we've read in Matthew, the 24th chapter, which is an answer to that question. When is the sign of your coming? Mm -hmm. 
And these Bible scholars out there are doing as much as they can watching the news every day for that key little piece of information that's going to confirm that the rapture is going to take place real soon. And then right after that is that tribulation period of time. We don't have to. Because we already know Yahshua has come. And we know that he's not hopefully out just there somewhere, but where? In us. So when he's in us, we have now been translated into, what is that, Colossians? Colossians, first chapter, 13th verse. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now we all know and understand that when Adam and Eve were had the transgression, the lights went out. And that prince of the power of darkness had a great rule all the way on down for 4,000 years to Yahshua Messiah, don't we? Mm -hmm. 4,033 years. That's that power of darkness that he has taken us out from. And he has brought us into his glorious light. Because the lights now come on. You can see and know something about Yahweh's purpose and pattern and plan of salvation. We had no clue back under in the darkness. Salvation was even there available. We were at the whim of the devil at every second. Now we have, on this side of the cross, hope. Because we're in the light. And we can see Yahshua working. Not only in someone else, but in us. And the greatest thing about this power of darkness, he wants you to doubt. He wants you to doubt. He wants you to believe that Yahweh cannot deliver you. And that's what the trouble was when they were here in the wilderness for 40 years. They just didn't believe that Yahweh is going to give them what he had promised to give them. And we don't want to end up being in that state situation either, and doubting that Yahweh can and is what he had promised is to be the almighty Savior. So hopefully somebody is in my subdued manner learn something. Right. Because the thing is is it's serious. And you didn't come here hopefully not to learn something. And I know you've learned something. And been edified. And that was my sincere hope that something would be said that would be edifying to the body. 